Alright, I'm here. So, what do we got today? Seriously? Okay then. Rocket Raccoon, aka Rocket Raccoon. Charged for trespassing in an unrestricted zone. And for biting an officer? Should probably have the guy checked for rabies. It says here he's an expert marksman. Prefers heavy weapons or his dual laser pistols. Has enhanced senses such as hearing, smell, and sight. Boy oh boy. That's one hell of a raccoon we got in here. And it talks to him. What is that, like the second talking animal we got in here? What was it, like uh, a chicken or... Oh, yeah, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into this guy's history. By now, I'm sure you've all seen the amazing trailer, which gave us a glimpse at the Guardians. Star-Lord, Gamora, Drax the Destroyer, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot. After seeing the trailer, you were probably like, Was that a fucking raccoon? And, Whoa, is that raccoon firing a machine gun? <laughs> That's fucking cool. Yes, this little guy sure did steal the show, but who the hell is he? Rocket's story begins way back in the days of Disco, the 70s. In 76, over at Marvel Comics, a young writer by the name of Bill Mantelo and artist Keith Giffen Yeah, that's how you say that, Giffen were in charge of putting out a backup feature for issue number 7 of Marvel Preview. Which is where Rocket made his very first appearance. Makes me wonder where the idea for this character even came from. Not again. These damn raccoons. Wait. Raccoon? Yeah. I know who our new character should be. <coughs> Batman! I think it's taken. <coughs> A raccoon? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Let's go with that. In actuality, the inspiration for Rocket Raccoon came from the Beatles song, Rocket Raccoon. The backup feature that Bill and Keith made was called The Sword and the Stars, Part 2, and is the very first appearance of our furry little friend. Our protagonist, Prince Wayfinder, finds himself on the mysterious planet known as Witch World, a planet that seems to be one giant forest similar to Endor from Star Wars. It's here where he meets a strange creature, a talking raccoon with a British accent. Probably a reference to the Beatles. The raccoon introduces himself as Rocky and helps the prince find food and shelter. But the two are suddenly attacked by a monstrous tree. The pl the pla the plagiosaur plagiosaur. <sighs> Whatever. After defeating it, a mystical being called Kirk I'll just go with that. Um and her animal army show up. The prince and raccoon are no match for her magic, and the story ends. So what's to happen to our heroes? Is Rocket doomed to become a coon's hat? What do you think, Pinky? <coughs> Unfortunately, we would never know, as the story was never finished. I guess nobody sent in their letters of support. Rocky would soon fall into obscurity for the next six years. But in the 1980s, he would make an unexpected return in the Hulk's 20th anniversary, Incredible Hulk number 271. What a bizarre way to celebrate the Hulk's 20th anniversary, being paired up with a talking animal. It's degrading. Don't you agree?
The story begins with our protagonist, the Hulk, finding himself on a mysterious planet known as Halfworld, located in the Keystone Quadrant, a planet that is one half a barren-ruled robot wasteland, and the other half a pleasant home to genetically modified animals, one of them being Rocky. It's here where Rocky mentions that his name is actually short for Rocket, and then we're introduced to his first mate, Walrus. They find the Hulk, but are suddenly attacked by a tank called the Robo Mower. With the Hulk's help, they make short work of it. He takes a liking to the funny talking animals and decides to join them. Why not? Rocket explains that Halfworld is being threatened by a mole named Judson Jakes, who seeks to acquire the fabled Gideon's Bible. He believes that with it, he can conquer not just Halfworld, but the entire Keystone Quadrant. Hey, this is a good opportunity to steal that one nostalgia critic joke everybody uses. I was frozen today! Ah, close enough. Whatever. The three of them take off in rockets... Uh, rocket... To a compound called Cuckoo's Nest. When they get there, it turns out Judson has already gotten his hands on the Bible. But, to make matters worse, he's also kidnapped Rocket's girlfriend, Lilla. Because that's what all bad guys do. So it's back to Rocket's... Rocket, this time flying to Judson's satellite headquarters, the Space Wheel. While Rocket saves Lilla, the Hulk encounters Judson's chief scientist, Uncle Pico. The talking turtle tells Hulk that he can return him to his own planet, Earth. With the help of a teleporter, he does just that, and the Hulk is back where he came from. Meanwhile, Rocket was unable to recover Gideon's Bible, but at least he saved his girlfriend. And I guess it just ends like that, at least according to all the websites I went to. Since I don't own the comic book myself, I can't say for sure. I'd go buy the comic book if I could, but it's fucking expensive. I mean, look at the prices. Yeah, I got better things to spend my money on. Like, tea and animal crackers. So that's the story to Rocket's second appearance. Bill Mantelo, the guy who created Rocket and wrote his first story, also wrote this one as well. And there was also a few more Beatles references that he added into this comic. The first is the comic's title, Now somewhere in the black holes of Sirius Major, there lived a young boy, name of Rocket Raccoon. That's a very long and odd title to give a comic book, but it's actually a reference to the opening line to the Beatles song, Rocky Raccoon the inspiration for the character. Now somewhere in the black mining hills of Dakota there lived a young boy named Rocky Raccoon. This character is most likely a reference to the fact that Paul McCartney, or maybe it was John Lennon, whichever one it was, was known as the Walrus. They also had that song called I Am the Walrus, so maybe it's a reference to that instead. Next is Gideon's Bible, which was mentioned in the song. Rocky Raccoon Checked into his room, only to find Gideon's Bible. And that's Hulk number 271 for you. <coughs> yep, now we can move on to 1985 when Rocket Raccoon got his very own miniseries. I guess the little guy was a big hit in Hulk number 271, because in the promotional comic book magazine, Marvel Age, issue 25, it was announced that Rocket would be getting his own four-issue limited series, and Bill Mantello would return to write all four issues. It would also be penciled by Mike Mignolia, there we go, who you might know as the creator of the comic series, Hellboy. Yeah, I like it a lot too, and the second one wasn't too bad, I liked it a lot. Unfortunately, since it didn't do so well, I doubt we'll ever see a third one. That sucks. In this miniseries, a lot of the ideas brought about in Hulk 271 were carried over to this comic. It still takes place on Halfworld, Rocket still has his friends, Walrus and Lilla, Judson Jake, Uncle Pico, the Killer Clowns, and Blackjack O'Hare. However, I'm not sure if these comics have any connection to the Hulk comic, as those events are never brought up in this story. And Gideon's Bible, which is now called the Half-World Bible, 
is somehow back in the hands of Rocket. I guess he got it back, although we're never really shown that, so... I don't know. Who cares? Here's the synopsis. In the Keystone Quadrant, there's a planet known as Halfworld, home to talking animals, robots, and the loonies, which are human mental patients. Like I said before, one half of the world is Roboland, and the other half is Animal Land. Some of the animals, like Rocket and his pals, are in charge of protecting the loonies, while the two toy manufacturers, Judson Jakes and Lord Divine, are in charge of creating toys to entertain the loonies. Both toy manufacturers want the other dead. That way, they would be the standalone toy maker and make a fortune. Thus, the toy war begins, and it's up to Rocket to put an end to it. As the story progresses, we discover the origins of Halfworld, where the loonies came from and why they're here, how the animals became so intelligent, and so on and so on. In the end, the villains are stopped and the loonies are cured of their illnesses. Rocket, as well as most of the animals and robots, aboard the Oscar ship and take off to the stars to find a home of their own. Just like in Hulk number 271, there are a few easter eggs littered about. First off, the title of issue 1 is called Animal Crackers. Why am I bringing this up? No special reason. I just really like animal crackers. I mean, just look how many of these damn things I've eaten. Hold on a second. Yeah, see? A box of them right here. Some boxes over there. There's a couple there. Yeah, kind of addicted to these things. Alright, for reals now. At the start of issue one, there are two plushies, one being of Rocket and the other being of Walrus. Aww, and look how cute they are. There's also one of Gumby too. Anyone remember that show? Then there's the sound effects when this guy gets blown away. Snap, crackle, plop. This is a reference to two things. First, it's the Rice Krispie characters, snap, crackle, pop. Second, the plop sound is probably a reference to the DC parody magazine, Plop. And throughout the four issues, the chimp guards screech out, Chim Chim Churi. This is probably a reference to the Mary Poppins song of the same name. Chim Chimini, Chim Chimini, Chim Chim Churi. A sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. And lastly, in issue three, there are two plushies of Sam and Max, from the Sam and Max games. So after Rocket flew off to find his destiny, he wasn't really seen for quite some time. He did make a single panel cameo in Quasar number 15 from 1990. There he is. Then in 1992, he made a minor appearance in three issues of the Sensational She-Hulk, issues 44 through 46. Like I said, it's a very minor appearance, but here's what goes on in the comics. Rocket is captured by a renegade group of alien scrolls disguised as a race of Dabari, aka the Asparagus people. At some point, She-Hulk materializes on the alien planet as an imprisoned. She finds that in the cell next to her is Rocket Raccoon, turned to stone. Turns out the Dabari have a weapon that can turn people to stone. What, like this thing? But after She-Hulk defeats the Skrulls, she restores Rocket back to normal. He then returns home to his fellow Half-Worlders. After that, Rocket would disappear into obscurity once again for the rest of the 90s and for the early parts of the 2000s. Oh yes, I remember now. He did make a single panel cameo in 2006's Exiles, issue number 73. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any pictures of said cameo and I don't own the comic book, so here's this instead. It wasn't until 2007 when Rocket finally came out of hibernation and made his big return in Annihilation Conquest, Star-Lord, part of the Annihilation Conquest story arc. It was in this four-issue series that Rocket and his best pal Groot met for the first time and have since then been the closest of friends. Yeah, exactly. This is also where we find that Rocket has a liking for the heavy over-the-top weapons, whereas before he would just dual-wield laser pistols. 
It's also hinted that Rocket might have a little bit of OCD in him, obsessive compulsive disorder. For example, he insisted on hand washing each member's uniform. He also cleans the same weapon multiple times, and when he's asked about this, he gets defensive. In this four issue comic, Star Lord, aka Peter Quill, is being held prisoner by an alien race called the Kree, who are in the middle of a war with another alien race, the however you say this. Instead of executing the prisoner, they decide to use him in leading a team of expendables to destroy a super weapon that the these things have. Not having much choice, he agrees. His team consists of other prisoners like himself. There's Bug, Deathcry, Mantis, Captain Universe, Root, and of course, Rocket Raccoon, who was apprehended for a restricted zone infraction. Whatever the hell that is, I don't know. I guess I should have researched that, but I don't care. I guess Rocket's not the only one who gets defensive about his OCD. Sorry. No, I'll, I'll stop now. So while Star-Lord acts as leader, Rocket is like his second in command. He helps keep the group together, letting them know when it's time to regroup, and helping them snap out of it when one of the other members accidentally kills their own. Looks like it's time for some space calamari! Yum! No, oh, this part's my favorite. When Rocket shoots a... well, a rocket at the ceiling and causes the whole place to come down on them. Oops. Watch for falling debris! And like I said before, Rocket and Groot are buddies. Even if Groot thinks of Rocket as vermin. When it looks like Groot is done for, Rocket takes it pretty hard, wanting to go back for him. But, when Groot returns, now much smaller, Rocket is overjoyed to see his friend alive. So, as you can guess, the Expendables beat the bad guys, and afterwards they ready themselves for yet another mission. The Annihilation Conquest series did pretty well, and thanks to it, Star-Lord and Rocket Raccoon, as well as the rest of the characters, gained a bit of a following. After Conquest, Star-Lord proposed to form a proactive team, ready to assemble at any given time, whenever a new threat would arise. Sort of like Space Avengers. Yeah, pretty much. In 2008, the Guardians of the Galaxy were brought back in their own ongoing comic after having been gone since the 90s. We'll get into that in another video. Rocket was a part of this new team, including a bunch of other people even a telepathic Russian dog. Cool. Star-Lord acted as leader, while Rocket was the one who held the team together. He even led at certain times. At the start of the series, this team of Space Avengers don't exactly have a name yet. Rocket is the one who keeps suggesting names to the point of annoying all the other members. <coughs> at some point in the comic, they find this guy, Major Victory, who for some reason has Captain America's shield. I haven't done any research on this guy, so I don't know why he has it. I didn't really care. But it does turn out he is a member of the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Let's see if, where's that comic at? It's somewhere in here. Oh, here it is. Oh yeah, that's the guy. Rocket takes a liking to the name, Guardians of the Galaxy, and thus we have our new Guardians of the Galaxy. At least for a little while. Not too long afterwards, the team breaks up after finding out Star-Lord had their minds tampered with to make them more willing to join the team. Even Rocket leaves. At this point, Rocket forms his own team of Guardians, consisting of Groot, Bug, Mantis, and that guy. Eventually the team comes back together, and they continue to protect the galaxy in a six-part story arc from 2009 called War of Kings. Afterwards, the team continued their duties until issue 25, when the comic was cancelled in 2010. But that wouldn't be the end of Rocket or his friends. 
as they would return for one more story arc, the 2010 six-part series, The Thanos Imperative. This story arc takes place right after Guardians of the Galaxy ended, continuing the story as Thanos has returned while a new universe called the Cancerverse comes to destroy everything. Just as before, Rocket continues to help the Guardians protect the galaxy. He even threatens Thanos at one point. Only the baddest of the badass would do something like that. Eventually, when the Cancerverse is coming to an end, Star-Lord tricks all the Guardians to teleport back to their own universe, while he and Nova sacrifice themselves to ensure Thanos never returns. Rocket demands that he be returned to save them, but it's too late. In the end, the universe is safe once more, but not without its sacrifices. Rocket and Quasar look upon the memorial made to Star-Lord and Nova, and an era comes to an end. So what else did Rocket show up in? <coughs> Annihilators. Alright then, let's get into it. So, with the Guardians of the Galaxy having come to an end, what would happen to Rocket? Would he once again disappear? Thankfully, no. In 2011, a four-issue miniseries called Annihilators was released. This was a follow-up to the Thanos Imperative. Now, while Rocket doesn't appear in the main story, he does get his own side story within the comic book, along with his pal Groot. In this side story, Rocket has taken the loss of Star-Lord pretty hard. The team has long since disbanded, so what does Rocket end up doing? Starting his own team? Actually, no, he gets a job as a mail carrier. And as you can imagine, it's not really that exciting. One day, he gets a strange package addressed to him. Upon opening it, a killer clown jumps out, similar to the clowns from Half-World, only this one is made out of sentient wood. It tries killing him, but doesn't stand a chance. Wanting to know why the clown was sent to kill him and who had sent it, Rocket heads for Planet X to find his buddy Groot. Once the two are reunited, they head to Half-World, Rocket's homeworld. But for some reason, he has no memory of the place. Rocket then starts to recognize familiar faces, such as Walrus, Black Jack O'Hare, and Lilla, who electrocutes him. I guess she's still a little mad at him for disappearing. When Rocket wakes up, he finds himself strapped to a machine that's supposed to help him remember everything. It does, and soon he remembers his friends, that Half-World is an asylum for crazies, that he was head of security, Oh, and there was this one villain called Star Thief. So this big bad guy or whatever, he caused a bunch of trouble on Half-World and it seemed like he was unstoppable. Fortunately, Rocket and his second in command, Blackjack, were able to imprison Star Thief. And the only way to have him freed is if all security members are present. And to ensure that would never happen, Rocket had his memories erased and he left Half-World forever. A bit confusing, I know. But now it seems as though Star Thief is free and is planning on leaving Half-World on a rocket ship. So Rocket and his friends have to make sure that doesn't happen. So as you can imagine, they do end up imprisoning Star Thief once again, through a pretty ridiculous way I might add. It involves Rocket dressing up as the bad guy's pet dog, Mr. Binky. I guess they didn't have any Twinkies around. Would be just as silly. <coughs> So with Star Thief taken care of and Half-World safe once again, Blackjack O'Hare asks if Rocket can stay as second in command. What, you don't expect him to give up first command, do you? Rocket declines the offer, believing that he and Groot should be out there, protecting the galaxy as the Guardians once did, whether it wants to be saved or not. And the two would continue to do that, as they got a follow-up comic the very next year. In 2012, Annihilators got a follow-up called Annihilators Earthfall. And just as before, Rocket and Groot appeared in their own side story within the comic book. This story isn't nearly as interesting as the first one was, nor is it as significant either. But I'll give a quick synopsis of it. Rocket and Groot go up against this guy, Mojo. He's an ugly looking bastard, even more so than Modok. He has the two of them in some sort of TV show where they go up against all sorts of crazy things. Think of it as the running man, I guess. Every now and then, the comic book will be interrupted by Mojo with an advertisement of Rocket Raccoon and Groot action figures.
Hey kids, are you sick of those boring ass toys? Who said that? We'll dump that shit right in the trash, because we got something that's way past cool. Way past cool! Rocket Raccoon and Groot action figures. The greatest toy since the Pet Rock. Who? That's right, your favorite talking raccoon and somewhat talking tree monster are available as action figures. Only $14.99 plus tax. With these toys, you can recreate all sorts of events, such as Rocket Raccoon digging through the trash. Extreme! Or Groot being a tree. Fun. Awesomely fun! They even say catchphrases, such as... And... So beg your parents to buy them today. You don't want to be the only one in the galaxy without them, do you? I don't even know who these characters are. Available at your local intergalactic Toys R Us. As you can guess, Rocket and Groot free themselves and stop the evil baddie. What a shock. So, what would come next for Rocket? That's right. With talks of a Guardians of the Galaxy movie, Marvel decided to reintroduce the team by giving them a new comic book series called... Guardians of the Galaxy. Obviously. This new ongoing series that started in 2013 revamps the Guardians, and this time, instead of having a shit ton of characters like before, we're down to just the five who will be in the movie. Which, unfortunately, means no Cosmo. <sighs> that sucks. So we got Star-Lord, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, Gamora, and Drax. Oh, and Iron Man is tagging along as well, for some reason. In this new series, the Guardians are doing what they did before, making pies. No, no, that's not what they're actually doing. What they're obviously doing is protecting the universe from all sorts of threats that may arise. Sort of like Space Avengers, Space Avengers, Space Avengers, Space Avengers. Now I don't think I need to get into too much detail about the story here, because I'll just end up repeating myself. It's mostly Star-Lord related, so it'll be in his own video eventually when I get to that. Plus, I'm getting tired. And all you need to know is what Rocket does, and that's being a badass. He still uses oversized weapons, he's still good friends with Groot, as well as Star-Lord, and he's still just as badass as ever. He even messes around with Iron Man a bit, which is pretty funny. That same year, Rocket and fellow Guardian member, Gamora, would appear in another revamped comic, Nova. In it, the two help 15-year-old Sam Alexander to control his newfound powers to become a great hero. The last thing to mention is that Rocket will be getting his own ongoing comic series come July 2nd. It'll be written and drawn by... Scooty? Sc Scotty? Scoo... <sighs> Known for his work on Marvel's Oz comics. The comic is done in a more cartoonish style, with a heavy focus on humor. Which isn't a bad thing, I'm just hoping it just doesn't get too silly. Well, that pretty much covers all his comic book related stuff. What else is there? Oh, okay. Rocket's television appearances now. Rocket never made any TV appearances until just recently, most likely because of the movie that's coming out. Rocket, as well as the rest of the Guardians, would make their television debut in the animated series The Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Episode 32, Michael Korvac. In this episode, a mysterious man by the name of Michael Korvac appears on Earth. The Avengers try to figure out what happened to Korvac, as he's been gone for years, supposedly abducted by aliens. Before they are able to do much, another team of heroes show up, the Guardians of the Galaxy. This team consists of their leader, Star-Lord, 
Rocket Raccoon, Groot, Quasar, and Adam Warlock. They're here to apprehend Korvac, saying that he isn't what he appears to be. A battle ensues between the Avengers and the Guardians, but they quickly learn that they're on the same side, and they have to stop Korvac, as he's a madman with unbelievable power. Rocket was voiced by Greg Elias, who had also voiced him in the video game Ultimate Marvel vs. Camcom. I'll get to that soon enough. Now Rocket's second appearance, as well as the Guardians, was in the animated series The Ultimate Spider-Man, Episode 43, Guardians of the Galaxy. In this episode, Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, finds a raccoon digging through his garbage, and is surprised to find that it talks, and carries a laser pistol. What's your problem, Hairless? Nova explains that the raccoon is his mentor, Rocket Raccoon, just like from the comic book. He also explains that he used to live in space and was a member of another group of heroes, the Guardians of the Galaxy. This time, the team has the same five members as in the movie, so no need to introduce them again. The Guardians, with the help of Spider-Man and Nova, must stop Korvac and his army of Chitari from destroying Earth. And before you ask, I don't think this is the same Korvac in the Avengers episode. In fact, I don't think these two series are connected, but I could be wrong. I don't know. This time, Rocket was voiced by Billy West, who's known for voicing Futurama characters, Philip J. Fry, Dr. Zoidberg, and Professor Farnsworth. Now, I love his voice work for these characters, but I'm not a big fan of his Rocket Raccoon voice. I'm sorry. You idiot! You complete and total idiot! And those were Rocket's television appearances. So, let's move on to games next. Rocket made his video game debut in 2011's Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom as a playable character. He's also the first member of the Guardians to appear as a playable character in a game. After you beat the story mode with Rocket, you get an amazing animated ending of him going to Raccoon City for some R&R. Having heard about the place from Chris Redfield, he thought it was some sort of paradise for raccoons. Yeah, not quite. There's a few references to Rocket's past throughout this game. First off is one of his victory quotes, which is... This quote comes directly from the comic book, War of Kings. See? He also brings up the Hulk, which he made his second appearance in one of his comic books. He sort of remind me of the Hulk, only much stupider. He mentions Halfworld, which is his homeworld. Let's go to Halfworld and have somebody experiment on you for a change! And lastly, he brings up the killer clowns to Hulk, which they had fought against in the past. Let's KO some space clowns again sometime, mate! For old times' sake! Then there's Rocket's costume from the DLC pack, Animal Pack, which is a reference to his original outfit from his miniseries. Rocket makes a reference to other things outside himself. His level 3 hyper, called Rocky Raccoon, has him bury the opponent in the ground, and has an airstrike drop a napalm bomb on them. He then goes on to say, I love the smell of napalm in the This is a reference to the film Apocalypse Now. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. He also makes mention of Bambi. And lastly, while holding up in mid-jump, Rocket will spin his tail to hover, similar to how Tails would do in the Sonic the Hedgehog series. As mentioned before, Rocket was voiced by Greg Elias, who I still prefer over Billy West. I'm sorry. Rocket made his second appearance in games in the MMORPG Marvel Heroes from 2013. Here, he was voiced by Steven Bloom. Eh, yeah, there's not really too much to talk about here. He doesn't play any significant role in the storyline, so there's that. I did find a few things, though. The four outfits that he wears are from his past comics, such as this one from the 2008 comics, then this one from his miniseries, and this one from the promotional image for Marvel Now, and lastly, the new costume from the new Guardians of the Galaxy. The last interesting thing that I could find to mention is that in his bio from the official website, it mentions his OCD, 
which hasn't been brought up since that one time. Rocket's latest appearance in games was in 2013's LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. The rest of the Guardians also show up as well. There was only one reference that I can find to Rocket's past, and that's when he brings up his old pal, Walrus. I keep telling Walrus that giraffes can't climb tall buildings. This time, Rocket was voiced by John DeMaggio. 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 <sighs> Getting sick and tired of this. Um, who's known for voicing Jake the Dog from Adventure Time and Bender from Futurama. You know, that's the second time Rocket's been voiced by a Futurama voice actor. The first was Billy West. Personally, I still like John. D this guy over Billy West. I'm sorry. And that does it for Rocket's video game appearances. So, what else is there? <coughs> Merchandise? Well, there's not a whole lot of it, so I guess we can talk about it. It's not like it's late or anything, it's only 4.04. Seriously, it is. Look at this. That's how late I'm filming this fucking shit. Let's go on. Since Rocket was never too well known, he never got any sort of merchandise outside his comic books. No action figures, no Amigo dolls, not even a water gun. It wasn't until recently, again because of the movie that's coming out, that he's gotten some stuff. In 2011, he was part of the Guardians of the Galaxy 3-pack from the Marvel Universe toy line. Then, Rocket was a builder figure in the Marvel Legends toy line from 2013. And this toy is, uh, a little mean looking. <coughs> then there's this plushie of him, which was a New York Comic Con exclusive. And man, I really want this thing. Yeah, $300? I don't think so. And lastly, there's gonna be all the Guardians of the Galaxy merchandise coming out for the film. So you can expect a lot more raccoon toys. Oh, there's even these cool Lego sets that are coming out. Those I really want. That does it for the merchandise. Now we can finally move on to the last topic, the film. The mention of a Guardians of the Galaxy movie was as far back as 2010, but it wasn't until 2012 when we saw our first look at the film at San Diego Comic-Con. The first thing we saw was some concept art, which gave us our first look at Rocket. Later on, we got a better look at Rocket's final design with this piece. People at Comic-Con even got to see a sneak preview of the film. Those who weren't at the panel got to see it like this. Now most people at the time had no idea who the Guardians even were, but they were excited for the film nonetheless. Even the raccoon was pretty awesome, they'd say. But could they really take such a silly idea as a talking raccoon and do it right? Well, they did it once with this film, so I don't see why not. Director James Gunn understood that the idea of a talking raccoon could easily become a silly cartoon character. Kinda like that guy. So he worked with real raccoons to get the right feel for the character. When talking about Rocket, he stated, and I quote, I've done a lot of studying with real raccoons, and we had real raccoons come in. We've done photography with them, I've played with raccoons, and fed raccoons, and dealt a lot with real raccoons, to get some of the behavior down, because it's really, really important to me that Rocket Raccoon, who is the heart of the movie, is not a cartoon character. It's not Bugs Bunny in the middle of the Avengers. It's a real, little, somewhat mangled beast that's alone. There's no one else in the universe quite like him. He's been created by these guys to be a mean-ass fighting machine. On August 30th, 2013, it was announced that Bradley Cooper would be the voice of Rocket, not a bad choice. He's a good actor. I liked him in the A-Team. This one is our booty! Then just recently, February 18th, 2014, we got an official teaser trailer to the film, and a much better look at Rocket in action. And hey look, there's a reference to his girlfriend, Lilla. Now the trailer didn't give us much of Rocket's story, 
But according to the website, Marvel Cinematic Universe Wiki, his backstory reads as such. Rocket Raccoon is an Earth-born raccoon that was recovered by an alien race. Brought to an alien world, Rocket was genetically enhanced so that he was given sentient intelligence. However, years of abuse and repetitive genetic rewrite caused Rocket to develop a vain and chaotic personality, driving him into becoming a gunslinging mercenary. During a visit to Xander, Rocket and his partner in crime, Root, were arrested by the Nova Corps and brought to the... Shit. They were brought to this uh, Penal facility. There, the pair joined up with fellow prisoners Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord, Gamora, and Drax to make their escape and become the Guardians of the Galaxy. So if this backstory is official, then it's a bit different from the comic books, isn't it? The biggest change being that he's a regular raccoon from Earth and not from Half-World as an already talking raccoon. This doesn't bother me though, because it just would have been too silly if they kept the original backstory. It makes sense for them to change it up a little bit. I'm glad you agree. And yes, as long as the core of Rocket is still there, such as his personality, then that's all that should really matter. And that's everything Rocket Raccoon related, at least to my knowledge. He started off as a bizarre, obscure character who slowly started to make a name for himself with the Guardians. And now, he's appearing in one of Marvel's big budget movies. How did that happen? Well, the future looks bright for old Rocky. I'm looking forward to his comic book in July, the toys, and, of course, the film itself. So, here's to hoping it doesn't end in disaster. Shit, I'm all out. <laughs>